Good morning and welcome to the Hard Luck Show. I'm a certified qualified West Side host, Steve Lucky Luciano. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, you've tuned into the greatest show on earth. It's Hard Luck Show, coming at you from the beautiful city of Los Angeles, California. Sitting across from me, my co-host and partner is Chumahan Bo, an American Indian, Southern Californian, elegant barbarian with another true crime story for your little ticklish little earbuds once again yeah oh blue eyes sean lewis certified uh, audio professional engineer for the hard luck show yeah. yeah all right let's just get right down to it let's stop playing around let's, let's stop fucking around let's get right down to it big lux yes sir Talk mr la been here for some time Talk to me did you ever hear of the College Hills fire? Do you recall that? It was a huge thing that did about $50 million worth of damage. I. It was like a brush fire that just got out of control. College Hills. No. College Hills. When was this? It would have been, I want to say, like in the 90s. And where was it at again? It was sort of like north in the valley, like up in the little areas around there. But it was pretty well known. I mean, it was a big ass motherfucking fire that got and destroyed homes. Strangely, nobody was killed. There was another fire, like in '87, at Ols Hardware. I don't know if you remember the Ols Hardware stores. Uh, that burned up and killed. Four people, including one kid named Matthew. This would have been around in the 87-ish. There was a guy that was running the Glendale Fire Department. His name was John Leonard Orr. Two R's on that. O-R-R. John Leonard Orr. And ultimately, there was a trial held because... After decades of these fires never being solved, mm-hmm. they accused the lead arson investigator of Los Angeles, who used to be the fire chief in Glendale. That I remember. You remember that? Yes. What do you mean? What do you remember? I remember about- that fucking, this fucking motherfucking lead arson dude was the one starting the fires. Listen. I remember that news. Listen, he... All right, just so, just to give you an understanding, this guy's pedigree was top notch. This was when fire investigation, like, was still kind of just becoming a thing, and he would give symposiums. And the lead speaker and the guy who published articles, right, John Leonard Orr, he was the guy that was going to like Fresno to talk to you know across the nation all the fire investigators talk about whatever and he even had a sick had like a sixth sense he was famous because there would be like a fire and then there'd be these investigators and they'd be like shuffling through charcoal and shit and then he would show up and he'd be like i'm feeling something like almost like one of those dudes trying to find water with a stick yeah and he'd be like under that rock and they'd look under the rock and see a delayed fire device and they were like, man, this guy's a fucking genius. He's like a fire savant. Like, thank God. Thank God, Glendale. Like the fire whisperer. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. He was the fire whisperer. And he was solving crimes. And, and like, they were doing statistics. And they'd be like, man, it's just crazy. Like, why are there so the, the arson? So good? Not only is how is it good, but how do we get. Like the arsons that have been found have like tripled in the last five years since you've been on the force. And John Leonard Order was like, because I'm so good. You had arsons before. They were just going undiagnosed because you didn't have the fucking genius on board. But nobody was getting found for these arsons, for these fires. Couldn't find them. They could find the device. Right. 
And these devices were all, well, the device was simple. The delay device was as simple as three cigarettes, a couple of matches with rubber band around it wrapped up in yellow legal pad paper. And what the delay device would do, and he would go up at the symposiums and show everybody how these things work. And he would do like little test runs for people to give a demonstration and shit like that. And so what these things were supposed to do, you would light the cigarettes. The cigarettes would give the guy 15 minutes to get away from the fucking thing. They would hit the matchbooks and then they would set the paper on fire. And he would be going into like hardware stores and like the, the, at the time, the time stores like Targets and shit like that, Big Five and all this bullshit. And he'd go like where the sleeping bags were or where like the pillows were or whatever it was. And whoever was setting these fires would set them up on these polyurethane foam things that just happened to just, I mean, they would just, they were highly flammable. <laughs> and then sometimes there would be one fire set here and then another fire set you know, in like three different blocks this way and three different blocks that way so that the fire department would be focused on one fire and one would get out of hand and burn down the whole building. And they couldn't figure this out. This was like the mystery of mysteries. Mystery of the ages, right? But there was one guy, a guy named Casey. His last name was Casey. And he was a fire investigator up in Bakersfield. Which back in that, even now, but back then, Bakersfield was like a fucking one horse town and nobody gave a shit. LA County was the big swinging dick. And they didn't, we're gonna. This guy said, you know what? Because they had a convention for arson investigation in Bakersfield. And during that time, three retail fires got set. Now, everybody was like, well, that's weird. Huh. Nah. What a coincidence. Casey was the only guy that was like, you know, what are the chances that you have all the arson investigators in town and that's when we have the first ever multi-retail building fire set? At first, he thought maybe there was an arsonist that was trying to be like, fuck you, you know, show you guys. So, but he looked at it and he found the same delay device. Three cigarettes, rubber bands, fucking matches, and everything. And during that investigation, he asked the FBI, he goes, hey, um, I think it might, can I get a list of all the people that came up to Bakersfield? Because some of the fires also were being set along like the five or the one-on-one, whatever it was that, that you drove up. It was just too coincidental. And that guy got laughed at for decades. No one, he's like, what are you talking about? So at some point, right? Huh? John Leonard Orr becomes the target of an ATF. How? <laughs> How does he all of a sudden at some point become the target of the investigation? Because one of the legal pad papers had a fingerprint on it. Oh, no. And it hadn't burned. Oh. And they had run the fingerprint back in whatever it was, in that 89 or 90 or something, I can't remember. And it came back with no match. Right? But they preserved it and they held on to it. All of the records finally got online. And they ran the print again. And it came back matching John Leonard Orr. Because 20 years before that, he had applied to the LAPD. Oh, shit. And he, as part of the application process, you take the fingerprints. And they started the investigation off of that. And when that happened, when that came back, they knew, one, we sent it back and we didn't get a match. 
Two years later, it's an older print. We do get a match. But he's now the most famous arson investigator. We got to make sure that this isn't fucked up. And nobody wanted a piece of that. So, <clears throat> John Leonard Orr started out uh, when he was 16 years old growing up in his family's home. His mother, with no warning, nothing, just up and left the family. Never saw her again. He had a fucked up upbringing to a certain extent, but there's nothing that's really known other than this weird thing that the mom does. At a certain point, he wants to become a cop. He applies to the LAPD. He passes the written test. He passes all the stuff, but he fails the psychological exam. Hmm. And he's all upset. Now, mind you, he's also been, right, a 7-Eleven cashier. During that time, he was, like, the best shoplifting, like, stopper that they had. He could spot these kids coming in, stealing whatever. That's what sent him to the LAPD because he's like, ah, fucking, I'm, I'm a, and he would, yeah, and he would pretend to kind of be a cop and stuff like that and, and act tough and he even helped like somebody at Sears where he saw someone walking out with tools and he like tackled them in the parking lot he doesn't work for Sears he's not any, he's like into this weird thing so when he goes to the cops and the cops say everything's good but you're mentally unsound buddy right he can't believe it he's like that's fucking insane so the guy who's in charge of it tells him like look you can hire your own psychologist private psychologist to run you through it and you can present that so he did he goes out he gets his own psychologist to say whatever he wants him to say comes back they still don't admit him but the head psychologist leaves the file on his desk and john Orr wants to know why am i not being allowed to be a cop leaves the file on the desk and says you know what i got to get a cup of coffee and walks out of the room so john Orr is there with the thing and whatever he reads in there convinces him he's never going to be a cop. And it's never revealed exactly what it is. So he has to turn to become a firefighter. So he goes to the L.A. fire department. This guy wants to be in a uniform so bad. Yeah. Right? So he goes to the L.A.F. But he can't carry the ladders. <laughs> They're too fucking heavy. He's like a little chubby walrus guy, and he can't carry these fucking ladders, so he gets washed out of the L.A. fire department. But just so happens that Glendale, and at the time, Glendale was the lowest paid gig in fire circles, was looking to hire, and they hired him. It was that fingerprint that got him on the map. So, right, they're investigating. By now, he's published some articles. By, and dude, he, used, he made a name for himself up in Glendale because he would show up at fires before like anyone else and he'd put them out and save the day, right? And when there was budget cuts coming, somehow there was fires that required like three trucks. So you can't have the budget cuts. Like this guy was somehow magically everywhere. And that Olds fire at that hardware store was deemed an accident, but this guy wanted, and he kept telling everybody, nah, it's arson, you guys don't know what you're talking about, but everyone shouted him down and said it was an accident, even, and it killed some people. So when that fingerprint came in, the ATF was put on him. So... What they did was they put a tracking device under his car to follow him around. What year was this? This has got to be like 90, okay. right? They put a tracking device on his car. And he's going up to Monterey or wherever to do another one of these symposiums. And they're like, man, he's going to light another fire. He stops and parks, right? And he's walking around his car and he looks down and he sees a wire hanging down. 
No. He drives to the police station and says, someone put a bomb on my car. And the guy went underneath and looked at it, pulled it out, and said, it's not a, it's not a bomb. It was a recording device. John Orr discovered that he was under surveillance. So he stopped doing fires for like, I don't know, like one or two years. But the ATF is still trying to get him. Right. All right. So eventually, right, eventually, they put another tracking device on his car. He's the first guy in California to have Teletrack put on his car, which was just a thing where, like, it sends out a homing device, and so they don't have to follow him, and it's not big or whatever. They wait, like, one or two years to let him get comfortable. They put that on his car. He's driving around. He's showing up in places or was just in places where the fires were set off, including like the College Hills fire and all this other kind of shit. So they finally catch up to him. And during this time, he was writing a book called Points of Origin. And this book that he wrote was about the lead arson investigator who was also the guy setting the fires. What? He wrote a book about himself. A fictional book about himself. Right. Right. And he sent letters to these publishers and would be like, you know, this is all part of an investigation. I was I was the target of an investigation once, but you know, blah blah blah. But it's all fiction. But like when you read through the book, the the instances would match up with various fires. And he's trying to get it published. And the ATF has gotten wind of this, right? And they're pretending to be like publishers and they're getting fake producers to have lunches with them to make a movie. And he's like doing all this stuff to get hands on the manuscript. They finally read it. And when they read it, not only is he knowing certain details that only he could know or like the arsonist would know, he's also, right, talking about how the arsonist is beating off at the fires. That when he sets a fire, he gets a hard on. <laughs> this is what, what? This, yeah, John, no, he's typing about how he's like, you know, he's like, you know, rubbing his chicken bake whenever the fuck, and he sets a fire or whatever it is. So, in order to avoid him setting another fire, they think they've got enough evidence. They bring him to trial, right? They arrest him, and when they arrest him, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't say anything. And they won't tell them what they've got on them. And when they bring them in, dude, they've got Fed cases against them and they've got state cases against them. So he goes uh, up on federal charges first. And he actually uh, is convicted. And I will spare you the details of the trial about the, the fingerprint, whether or not it was too old, all the dumb shit that it goes through. But ultimately, it's the manuscript that mainly convicts him because all of the fires match up and the jury in the federal system was like, whatever. So once he's convicted, now this is right around the O.J. Simpson time. And in fact, it's right after Rodney King. When they went in, to uh, search the stores and all this other stuff, they had to do so under guard with police officers with guns because the riots had already started. So they're doing searches for evidence in buildings and all this other stuff, and the riots are going on right outside, and they're trying to do this trial. And then shortly thereafter, after the federal thing happens, O.J. Simpson, and he goes to L.A. County because now the state's going to try him. And in L.A. County, he's now you were telling me, Lux, that you met an arsonist in prison or you, you and he was doing 10 years. That's exactly how much federal time John Leonard or got was a 10 years at that point. Do you remember that? No. You told me you said I was a guy who was doing 10. Yeah, years. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I don't know how much time he did. But I remember meeting to some dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how much time he was doing. He's up in San Francisco. <laughs> right. He was like at something. Anyway, this guy, <laughs> this, 
this guy, so when he goes to L.A. County, he's in L.A. County right when O.J. Simpson's in L.A. County. When he's in, when he's in L.A. County and O.J. Simpson's there, he's, he's already kind of notorious. They put him, and he said he, he overheard O.J. say, I covered up for that bitch for 12 years. And I think he was talking about Nicole. But I don't know what, what, what that was in reference to. But anyway, point is, is he's there and he's in L.A. County. Now, at that point in time, the state didn't want to prosecute everything, go to trial. So they want to cut a deal. They said, tell you what, you plead guilty to three fires and we'll let you out in like 2002. So John Orr does right he fucking signs out or whatever it is does the deal one of the fires nobody thought about it and it was a restitution gig his attorney was like let's get you one that's not going to cost a lot of restitution there was this building emporium or something like that it's only 60 bucks of damage so he signed it problem is 60 bucks problem is the delay device was there and there was all these other fires including the Olds fire that killed four people, the College Hills fire, and some other fires. Oh, fuck. So as soon as he signs that deal and says, yeah, okay, I plead guilty to that, da 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 Like one or two years goes by and the task force is still working. And they start uncovering more evidence. And they realize that those delay v- devices were a part of the other ones. So they bring those charges And he gets convicted of murdering those three people. And then, dude, they were talking about how the Olds Olds fire was a flashover fire. You know what that is? No. So, like, a flashover fire is when the... So, dude, in reading this book... There was like a uh, a situation where it was like um, where they were somehow I got into researching how fires work and like I'm like they were, they were like how does a candle burn and I'm like you just light the wick and that's what it is but that's not how it works because how come the wick stays so long right you ever notice that like the wick doesn't shorten as much as the other shit. What's going on in the candle, and this will lead into flashover, is the wick, the burning at the top of the wick is melting the wax. Okay. It's releasing gas that's in the wax. That gas goes up the wick and, because I guess gas rises or whatever. And when it goes up the wick, it's the flame at the top burns that gas. It's not burning the candle. It's not really burning the wick. It's burning the gas that's in really? the wick. Really? Because everything releases combustible gas when it gets hot enough and melts. Everything, and that's what a flashover fire is. So in a larger situation like this room, right, this podcast room, if we lit one of these chairs on fire and it started getting hot enough, if it reached, once it hits about 500 degrees, all the gas in the woods, all the gas in this, um, the Hard Luck Show banner and all that stuff would have started filling the space up. And so you need, you need the, you need the combustible material like this gas, you need the fire, and what's the other thing you need? Oxygen. Oxygen. And that's what a flashover fire is. All the gas has been melted. There's a gas layer, this chemical layer. The moment someone opens the door and oxygen was in, everything ignites at the same time. And you can't outrun that. That's what happened at the Olds fire. They had, back then, the polyurethane and all the stuff, all the, basically all the foam that was in sleeping bags and was like gasoline, essentially. That fire had gotten to a certain size where it melted all that stuff. And then when they tried to escape to open up the fucking doors, everything exploded and killed like all those people. So they bring the, they bring the fucking trial. And the jury comes back and was like, yeah, you're guilty, dude. Right? He gets 
whatever he gets, life without parole. Right, and it's like one of the craziest stories. Another thing that I learned from this this thing is that he was also lighting, he would also put the delay device where potato chip bags were. Mm. Potato chip, potato chips are super flammable. Potato, Light one on fire. Potato chips are super flammable. All that oil. Oil and carbohydrates. And then I started watching all these videos where people were just taking chips like if you are hiking and you get stuck yeah. you could light chips on fire like for a campfire to yeah. start a campfire right. and it burns for a long time same thing with doritos turns out doritos are highly flammable really i never tried a dorito yeah you can burn a motherfucking dorito so they eventually made a movie out of this guys life it's called like point of origin and it stars Ray Liotta and John Leguizamo. Mm. Oh yeah. I wonder who's the arsonist. <laughs> John, it's uh, Ray Liotta. Mm. And rest he, in peace. Listen. Turn on your video camera, Junior. <laughs> I want a record of this guy's work. For seven years, Los Angeles County has burned at the hands of one man. Could we be talking serial arson? And for seven years, he's been pursued by John Orr. Now, typically these guys are loners. They have trouble with relationships. They have trouble with their jobs. They jack off when they see something burning. Dude, listen to that voice. When was the last time you heard that movie voice? Mm -hmm. Los Angeles has been played. They don't do trailers like that anymore. Dude, they don't really do trailers. Dude, I, I listened to a, a story about the, one of the guys that had that voice. And HBO it, film. And then there was a bunch of imitators, but he was like the main one, and he got a lot of work. Yeah. And then he died, and that's when they stopped doing that kind of trailer. <laughs> Old Blue Eyes has one problem. Mm -hmm. A crazy bitch that lives across the street attracting homeless people. Head of L.A. County's Chief Fire Investigation Unit. An expert. An expert. Of origin. Point of origin. <laughs> They're trying to make it. Dude, it's a straight to mug a television film, bro. You can look. Dude, For it's sure. crazy because it's, it's got Ray Liotta in it. Look so at that font. Terrible. Yeah, that font is like what comes stock with your fucking word. <laughs> it's been rigged to keep the flame burning. But where there's smoke, there's fire. There's smoke. Smoke. So, so there's, who is that? And where there's fire, there's smoke. I mean, dude, who wrote that? Where there's smoke, there's fire. And when there's fire, there's smoke. <laughs> and if you're smoking, Near a fire, you're probably going to be smoking <laughs> and on fire. John Orr. Oh, it's, it's, right, right. Look at long, John Leguizamo. Did you ever wonder why John was so good at finding these time delay devices? Cannot exist. Without them being played. Without the other. I feel like There's I'm being no played. way. I know him better than you, man. There's no way that he was the torch. They think it's me. So that looks like Ray Liotta's probably worst role. Yeah, that was, I don't know what that is. But in any event, the book that he wrote, Point of Origin, got published. That got him convicted. He published it. So but, that's based on his book. Yeah. The one he, fuck, that's crazy. But in ultimately, I think the families were able to sue to make sure that the restitution money came out of. So you said that he copped to like three fires? Yeah, he pled guilty to three fires. First of all, they think he said about 2,000 fires. There's a lot of uncharged fires that they couldn't do. And he was like, he had like a, he had four wives. He went through wives like people go through underwear. Oh, you mean he had like a, a serial wives. Serial wives and girlfriends and, and apparently he was like really weirdly kinky. Like he wanted to like, you know, you know, get his weasel wax down in the basement of the fire department or and he had a cop set my balls up. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, he was like he he 
you know, was dating a cop or married a cop or something, and he, like, you know, had her suck him off in the jail cell. <laughs> this all, like, came out later, and, you know, he was like, it's, and it's, it's, what's crazy about it is, is that, um, let's see if we can get, like, in his own voice, because they got interviews with him on Nova. When, when before, uh, yeah, like PBS Nova. Yeah, exactly. Let's see if we can. He here he is telling, and this is what the guy looks like now. Now, or I don't know if he's still alive, but this is what he looks like now. <clears throat> Let's see. The standard profile of uh, a serial arsonist is very similar to uh, serial That's killers. Uh, they're loners typically. Uh, they have difficult times in relationships, spotty work histories. Uh, Sometimes have physical disabilities, uh, skin disorders, uh, alcoholics, and skin almost disorders? to a T, uh, every one of these 10 or 12 that I was acquainted with or arrested uh, fit that profile or that mold. So, th I mean... So that was before he went to jail? No, look. Look at that. That's a prison window. He's oh, in jail. Oh, shit. He's still in, in jail trying to act like this was a government setup. He... Dude, no way. The first one, he claimed and his lawyer claimed that it was all a conspiracy by the the, the government that they would just wanted us they just glommed onto this idea that that fingerprint really wasn't his no one bought into it he was like yeah you got the wrong guy the thing that that kind of nailed him in that investigation was that he found out that he was under surveillance but he never went forward to anybody to say like why am i under surveillance so that like kind of hung him um you know he, he where he was at different times was always for like for instance there'd be like these details that would come out where there was all these brush fires up around glendale or something right so one of the fire people was like let's put up cameras to, just so we can watch 24 hours and john Orr like showed up was like where are the cameras gonna be at and then you know the guy told him because they're all on the same team and then all of a sudden the fire started being where there weren't cameras. Right. <laughs> Let's see. Um, here's an, an, another. How does this one, dude? Let's see this. This chick. This chick was one of the investigators. Of course, on the day that we had determined, based on MO, there might be some activity. Uh, John discovered the device on his vehicle that one of the wires had come loose and was right. hanging down below the bumper and he noticed it when he'd made a stop uh, and it was a circus from there. Something was going on here that That's I really him. didn't know exactly what and I didn't put two and two together until I got back into town and was rereading my notes for my book and remembering that there was a fire in that very same town several years before that I had witnessed. And the only thing I could I, I could possibly think of was that the local cops felt that maybe somebody attending that conference and that Fresno conference that uh, happened in 1987 uh, had developed some suspects. And lo and behold, I must be one. Lo and behold, when someone says lo and behold, I almost know they're full of shit. Who talks like that? Lo and behold, and lo and behold, who the, the fuck does that even mean? And and so look at that video. This is this is. Hunt for the serial arsonist Nova, 1995. I think he's finally convicted for the murders and everything in 2002. And the jury Damn. deadlocked on the death penalty. Really? And he's got daughters. They brought his daughters on the stand and they were like trying to defend him, but they did admit that there was times that he would see a briefcase with cigarettes and rubber bands in it and he never smoked. <laughs> he did. <laughs> he didn't smoke. <laughs> but those weren't his delay devices. By the way, everyone in hard luck world can thank uh, Daniel Marsola for this one because uh, this was his idea. Um, Popo beard oils. Highly combustible Popo beard oils. Yeah, yeah. Stay away from open flames. Yeah. Stay away. Don't smoke and, and put on beard oil. Oh, you don't want to do that. Yeah, that's probably not a good idea. No, and dude, if you get a beard oil fire started, don't use water to put it out. That just spreads oh, it. Oh, shit. You got to use like salt or something. What is that? <laughs> yeah. You got to use salt or baking Sand. powder. <laughs> you got to stop, drop, and roll. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go to the beach. All right, this is, uh, let's see what this is. Four cases for BA, one, two, three. 
the story isn't over. Early in 1995, John Orr was arraigned on 26 new charges, including four counts of murder, resulting from deaths in a 1984 arson fire. Or anyway, um, this is maybe, they think is maybe the, the biggest or the most deadly arsonist in California history. That they know of. It's really hard to catch an arsonist because they fucking, they, they, um, most of the time stuff burns up. And a lot of arsonists are doing it for insurance money or whatever. They're hired to do it for insurance money. Well, this guy was just some kind of freak of nature that was trying to, the psychology of it they thought was that it was, he was getting back at the LAPD and authority. It gave him a sense of control because he could, make the pe the workers or whatever go to all these different fires and manipulate them and cause them to uh, he's probably just giving himself fucking overtime <laughs> I don't know man. I, I read through it I was trying to you know there is something about fire that is mesmerizing for sure you ever like stare at a fire? Oh, are you kidding me? All the time. Like, hit, what do you mean all the time? I mean, every time I see a fire, I'm like, fuck, dude, it's so cool. And I, there's something about electricity and fire that like they both behave very similarly. Like if you watch like one of those like plasma balls or whatever, yeah, it looks like fire. And I've always like thought about like, what is that? What is that that like they're like cousins or something? And I think about like how that phenomenon is so closely related. I mean, think about how hot in, like electricity is and if you ever get shocked or whatever. Right. I mean, electricity can start fires. Fuck, yeah. Like sparks and shit. Blah. It's crazy. Blah. Yeah. <laughs> Blah. Crazy. But, um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I won't play the, the outro, but I'll, I'll put it in later. Oh, is that so what you're going to do? That's what I'm going to do later. So I guess um, I guess this is the end of that. Yeah, I guess this is the end of that. I mean, so if you got any shout shout outs, plugs, um, I want to give a shout out to the hyena who's walking on two legs, going on nine months now. Oh, I saw that. The lion yeah. broke his legs. A anybody out there, if you're listening, to Mr. and Mrs. Earbud, do yourself a favor. Look up two legged hyena. This motherfucker is alive, thriving. Shoulders are like Bound, bam, balancing on two front legs. <laughs> yeah, and there's like <laughs> video of, of like lions and hippos at the watering hole or something, and they're like trying to conduct normal business. <laughs> and right in the middle of their business, this like two legged hyena just comes walking through, and they just kind of like look at him, like, What the fuck? Did you just see that? <laughs> He's surviving on two legs. Um, yeah, Ovanda Bowen LLP, <clears throat> right? We won't defend uh, serial arsonists like John Lennon or, but we will help you estate plan, figure out your family law issues. Shit, I got a lot of listeners that just hit me up for a quick little question and I hit them with it. I'm like, yeah, you can do that. Nah, I don't do that. Here's how you do it. Hit me up. Sean at movemental.media for all your audio and podcasting needs. If you ever need anything, corporate, semi-corporate, amateur corporate, audio, you know, come hit me up. I'll hook it up for you. Sorry. And um, don't forget to hit us up at www.hardluckshow.com. What a portal that is. It's an amazing portal. Portal? Yes. It's got all like? kinds of links. Merlin to uh, that's what they call it online when it's a portal like an online portal you are you know a dungeon mean? master you little freak. true um, it's a portal to all kinds of places especially especially gum road gum road. gum road you know what gum road. we've been getting a lot of proto episode sales yeah yeah I great just saw yeah. early episodes what are on those early episodes you silly oh man mother? I could tell you but you know then you'd have to burn me yeah I then I'd have to burn you there is a lot of stuff from King Salmon uh, back in the day with Smoked his, Salmon uh, yeah Kippers and Smoked Salmon there's a whole show like a whole series 
of him just trying to nail his intro. Oh, that was the best. Man, it is so good to watch him fail and fail again and then finally nail it. Yeah, remember his uh, radio voice? Hey, this is Matt King Show. Hey, <laughs> this is the Airmail Show. Ed Bueno. Ed Bueno, when did you start throwing bags? <laughs> yeah. Uh, vibes rolling papers, supermax cookies, cookies. Yep. Uh, what up? Supermax, the uh, supermax summer, hard- summer capsule, capsule. Yep, yep. supermaxhardware.com, right? Purple beard oils, yep. And like we do about this time, right? Audio, <laughs> I mean, in the hard luck show.